Hello, bonjour, hola, Kasek Squiet, White, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, just as we let this waterfall of, of people joining us this evening, we just listen to the rain and the bird song. Maybe take a couple of seconds to look out of the window or take some deep breaths before we dive into this fantastic learning opportunity. Over a hundred people, welcome, welcome, welcome. I wish I could see all of your smiling faces, but um, we're so grateful that you've joined us today. So I'm Jade, uh, I'm part of the team at the Outdoor Learning Store uh, with a North American uh, charitable sort of social enterprise that's dedicated to bringing outdoor learning equipment, tools and resources uh, to you. Um, we work closely with Take Me Outside, who are our uh, partner in delivering this workshop. I join you today from the traditional unceded territories of the Sinaiks, the bull trout people um, nestled between the Columbia and in the Columbia mountains between the Selkirks and the Monashies. And this place is special. It's called Skikin, um, where the ridge lines meet the water. Uh, and it's a very special place. It's also cherished and loved and traveled upon and hunted upon by the Shikwetmik, Okanagan Silks and Tanaha First Nations. And so I am deeply grat uh, grateful for all of their work and support uh, for our planet this now and forever. Uh, so I'm just going to share my um, slideshow with you and welcome you to the next in uh, the spring virtual workshop series. Uh, today is um, the 16th of May and we're doing resources for World Oceans Day. So we know when we're talking about land-based learning or outdoor learning, the indigenous perspectives are at the heart. And so we are incredibly um, dedicated to this work. And so through that, we've developed um, alongside our indigenous advisors, um, a four seasons of learning uh, journey. It's a course based um, on really diving deep into truth and reconciliation, because it's not just enough to do a day. It's not just enough to focus on for Indigenous History Month in June, but to, to really commit seasonally across the year. Um, and so there are online modules that will be a mixture of activities, outdoor sessions for you to do independently, video, audio, uh, and some text online, short and sweet, but very powerful. And then 10 incredible live workshops featuring each of these phenomenal uh, Indigenous voices sharing a different perspective about what truth and reconciliation means to them and sharing that journey with you. Uh, this runs will run from October 2023 this year until June. So it's kind of the school year, we'll give you September to get situated. Um, and we kick off with Robin Wall Kimmerer. Um, if you haven't done any of our trainings, you can do what we're calling season one, uh, which is the sort of modules from reconciliation education that really talk to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission work. Uh, they're short online modules. Uh, and again, right now we're going through some fantastic live workshops uh, with Indigenous Knowledge Keepers. So please. Um, we encourage you to sign up, go to outdoorlearningstore.com slash four seasons of learning um, or just onto our homepage and you'll find it there under the professional learning tab. Uh, we would love to see you there. Um, and on top of that, we have um, a whole bunch of resources that are Indigenous created, Indigenous curated and uh, uplift Indigenous voices uh, from coast to coast and top to bottom. So um, it is National Indigenous History Month next month. We do have a couple of fantastic workshops in this series um, with Indigenous creators, but we encourage you to have a look at our Indigenous learning resources and know that when you do that, um, you support uh, Indigenous owned um, creatives. Just a real quick mention of our international partners. We couldn't do this. It takes a village. These are people with fantastic resources. If you go to our website and our partners and supporters page, these are our US partners and Canadian, you'll find resources, opportunities to connect for workshops, other professional development, um, research. It's all there and we really hope that you'll enjoy it. And today we're talking uh, about water and ocean resources, particularly in advance of World Oceans Day on June 6th. So water rangers are here to talk about fantastic things. Um, and of course, the full team. So I'm going to stop my share. And also I've been letting the music play, let the birds sing, hey, in the background there. Um, 
And so this is Resources for World Oceans Day. Um, speaking first, um, we'll have the fantastic uh, Maxine Koski, who's joining us from um, Project WET. Now, uh, Maxine is the National Education Coordinator for Project Wet Canada, retired teacher with over 35 years of experience teaching students for kindergarten to grade 12. Um, during this time, she was instrumental in, in coordinating inclusive outdoor and environmental education experiences for students. Um, an inquiry-based approach and using Project Wet activities has been fundamental in her education programs and to help promote environmental knowledge and stewardship. Um, so welcome, Maxine. Um, after Maxine, we'll have Laura Gilbert. Laura Gilbert is the Community and Operations Manager for Water Rangers. She's got a background in environmental engineering, integrated water resource management, and is finishing up her PhD in water ethics at McGill University. Water Ranger's mission is to empower communities with the tools to understand and care for local waterways. Uh, and at Water Ranger, she helps run their education programs and supports their community of water testers, of which we hope perhaps you will become one too. And last but most certainly not least, joining us from the fantastic ocean is Daphne Austin. Um, Daphne uh, works with OceanWise and um, she's the online specialist uh, for learning and ocean literacy. Through online engagement, she helps others connect with the ocean through live programming, youth dialogues and more. With a Bachelor's of Science uh, in a combined major of Oceanography and Biology from the, UBC, the University of British Columbia, UBC. She's worked to communicate environmental awareness through Patagonia, the Vancouver Aquarium, OceanWise and more. Um, so pretty fantastic lineup for you all today. Um, that's it from me. I'm going to pass you over to the fantastic Maxine, who I was so grateful uh, to meet in person for the first time after we were working virtually at the National Outdoor Learning Conference that happened last week. Um, and so I will pass it over to you. Thank you so Jade, much. Jade, I don't want to I don't want to delay the uh, presentation, but we also <laughs> usually do polls to see where we're <gasps> from oh and also I'll say hi I'll say hi to you. I'm so sorry you know what we just mentioned in the conference we had a huge conference with over 450 educators and that's been uh, filling my brain for the last little while so we had a little break here right I haven't seen you for a couple of weeks uh, and so I'm losing all my structure in the excitement of getting into it so please Steph say hello I'll get the polls ready to go <laughs> all good that's why we have a team yes <laughs> um, I'm Steph. Uh, I'm the program coordinator for Taking Me Outside. Um, I'll be working behind the scenes uh, to gather your questions and keep things on track in the Q&A or the chat or wherever you're sharing uh, today. And I'm uh, here on behalf of Take Me Outside, but also on behalf of our 70 plus amazing outdoor learning partners uh, that Jade showed us earlier in the lovely slideshow. And I'm joining you. Uh, I live, work, and play on uh, Coast Salish land, more specifically uh, Coatzin territory, home of the Cowichan tribes and Hokaminum speaking peoples. I'm very grateful to spend time on that land and just been uh, foraging for lemon balm and stinging that all lately and getting the last of those. And it's, it's yeah, I'm always happy to be there and also to be here in this virtual space with you all. And if you want to share which territory you're, you are joining us from in the chat, some of you are already doing that. Um, I would love to see that. And, uh, but Jade's also going to run a poll in a minute so we can see generally where everyone's coming to. So happy to be here. Amazing. Thank you so much, Steph. And Steph was um, a mighty admin and support machine through the conference, just always being there whenever uh, she was needed for all these things. So started the first question here. Um, where are you joining us from? And actually, in fact, it's launched both polls. So make sure you scroll down, go for it. Um, and just a heads up, we are in webinar format. We used to be in workshop format. So um, please type your questions in the Q&A or the chat. Steph and I will be in there working away, collecting them, and we'll pose them to each of our three presenters at the end. We'll hopefully have about 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A time at the end. Um, please make sure if you're um, typing in your chat box, there's three little boxes, uh, three little dots, sorry, in that box, and you can change... Um, who you're sending it to to make sure that it's everyone not just hosts and panelists for example if you want to share resources in the chat or connect with people we will be adding some links in there that are relevant to the work you're doing um so please uh get involved um okay i'm going to just give it a couple more seconds on that poll again if you've got any questions please uh type them in the chat or the q a if um you would like to have um 
post captions, you can click more and hit captions um, and that will show uh, the transcript across the screen if you um, need support um, with understanding what's going on. Okay, I'm going to end the poll in five, four, three, two, one. Here we go and let's share those results. Okay, so nobody from Antarctica yet to see one. I believe one day it will happen. Um, but look, it's Canada in the US, it's Turtle Island. I'm so grateful uh, that you're joining us from across there. Um, and who are we? We've got formal educators from every grade, early childhood educators are, are showing out in force tonight, forest or admin, informal parents, and none of the above, but just passionate people. Thank you for your passion. Each and every one of you is important. Each and every one of you will build those connections and relationships that shape the lives uh, of the world and of our future decision makers. So I'm very excited to have you here. Thank you for making sure we got all the relevant information, Steph. And I gracefully, averagely gracefully, not massively gracefully, pass it over to you, Maxine. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Jade. I'm just going to get my screen ready to share. Oh, my apology. I probably should have. Looks like it wants me to start it before I. Hmm. My apology. I do yeah. want to acknowledge that I am um, in Regina, Saskatchewan on Treaty 4 territory. And I acknowledge that in the Indigenous ways of knowing, their knowledge, their perspectives are fundamental to water education. And I am on my journey to learn and understand Oh, I just have to move this away. There we go. My apology. Okay. Project Wet Canada is the official youth education program of the Project Wet, I'm sorry, of the Canadian Water Resources Association, CWRA. It was brought into Canada in 1996 through an international host agreement with the Project Wet Foundation. Those of you who are, are with us tonight from um, the United States, um, I will show the Project Wet Foundation website. And those of you um, in Canada, I'll show you our Project Wet Canada website as well. The uh, goal of Project Wet is to give youth knowledge about water in its all forms, an appreciation, appreciation for stewardship of water resources, and decision-making skills that focus on how to think about water and water, water management, but not what to think. There are um, four main education um, professional development um, guides that Project Wet Canada offers. The first one is our Project Wet 2.0. It's um, anywhere between a four and six hour workshop, depending on whether it's virtually, whether you have homework, you do um, some of your own um, work at home. It um, has 65 complete multi-level lessons that covers our seven broad themes. Project Wet Manjol 1 is our Canadian French program with, with 21 complete multi-level lessons. And it's based on three of the main themes. And we are hoping to, at some point, develop more of our French resources. Uh, Lou Pierre in Quebec has graciously um, done some um, translations of, of a few of our songs for Getting Little Feet Wet, which is our early years um, program, our ECE. It has 11 activities that are specifically based for the younger audience to help them understand water. Our new program, Climate, Water and Resilience, I'll focus a little bit on during this presentation. It is um, our new resource that we are offering certification workshops virtually and in person across Canada and provinces and territories. And it's focusing on students in grade nine to 12. And there are nine complete activities that are um, mainly meant to be taught in the order that they appear in the book. Project Wet Foundation always also has a wonderful collection of student discovery series with over 25 titles, and many are available digitally. They, um, the ones you see before you are five that focus on ocean education, including exploring oceans, uh, sea turtles, fish and fishing, discover the marine mammals, and, and about floods. The main uh, framework or themes for our Project Wet programs include 
the different physical and chemical properties of water, that water is essential for all life. It connects all their systems, that it's a natural resource that needs to be managed, and that it exists within social and cultural contexts. All of the activities in each of the books, Project Wet 2.0, Project Wet Montjolin, Getting Little Feet Wet, and Climate Water and Resilience follow the same activity format, where you're given suggestions for grade level, subject areas, you have a uh, summary explaining a, a quick little explanation of the activity, including objectives, all the materials you will need, and background information. You do not have to be an expert in order to use this program. You are provided background information as well as suggested readings in the reading corner and other resources to further your understanding in the teacher resources section. Every activity is explained step-by-step step for you to use, including the warm-up, the activity itself, and the wrap-up. Um, suggested assessments and other extensions are, are also available to you in all of our programs. The Climate Water ex, um, and Resilience Activity Format has three additional parts to it. It includes a climate connection that connects a real-world relevance for students' um, and it also presents a rationale for that, STEM connections to careers, and also a climate resilience activity as part of the activity itself. It's like an extension. The climate water uh, and resilience activities, there's nine of them, and I want to point them out. The first one, weather tuification, deals with the difference between climate and weather. The earth greenhouse, ga greenhouse looks at the greenhouse gases and how the increase in mainly carbon dioxide, which is human caused, caused, increases the overall temperature on the earth. So it's increasing how much sunlight is reflected back, which increases the temperature on land and in our oceans, which leads us to ocean rising, which looks at um, increase in temperature of water causes an increase in um, um, how much space water takes up. It also, an increase in temperature causes the melting of our solar, our polar caps, sorry, and our glaciers, which will can cause the will cause the ocean to rise, which will largely affect coastal regions and islands, which then also brings us to looking at greenhouse gases and increase in temperature to ocean osteoporosis, which looks at the pH balance of the ocean and how it's increasing in acidity, which hinders our animals in the water who need to build their shells from finding the materials they need. The next activity, Soil to Supper, looks at soil moisture and dealing with um, hot, dry, wet, cool, and different um, types of weather conditions. The Breathing Boreal looks at the, the freeze thaw of our, our boreal forest. Climate Invaders looks at invasive species, plants and animals within our water systems. And we have some activities in 2.0 that also looks at the different layers of the ocean. Water for all water users looks at all types of ways that water is used and that it needs to be accessible and available to all water users, plus our plants and animals. And then the water and diseases. I wanted to point these out because this program, we do offer certification virtually and we also offer it in person. Um, we will have one coming up, so those people who are interested can always send me an email and I can make sure that you are part of that. These certification programs right now are offered free through our partnership and memorandum of understanding with the Canadian Meteorological and Oceanographic Society, CMOS, through their, Canadian, their Environment Canada Climate Change, their ECCC grant. So keep that in mind. I'm going to just stop sharing here. I want to take you to our websites real quick to show you that um, when we talk about resources for teacher, as a, as a teacher myself, I it was important for me to know how a resource will help me meet my the outcomes and indicators of my curriculum. On the top um, right-hand corner, you'll see FR for French. We do have... Um, most of our information also available in French, in French for immersion and Francophone people. We have an introduction to our program, an overview of our guides. And then here is where on our interactive map, if you hover your mouse over, you will find your local coordinator. For example, I'm in Saskatchewan, Leah Jepp 
is our coordinator. She's with Sask Outdoors and she runs all of our project wet certification programs in Saskatchewan. Leah also offers virtual training that is available to everybody across Canada and also in the United States if your coordinating body will allow you to. In BC, we have Carrie Morton, who is with the Habitat Conservation Trust Foundation. So we have some independent organizations, but we also have different government agencies that run our program. We are, if we don't have a coordinator for your area, I would be as a national coordinator, the person you would contact. We have wonderful sponsorship and funding from, um, with our Promo Science Grant in previous years that have uh, allowed us to purchase manuals so that we can provide free certification for an Indigenous educators and people of Indigenous students, and also our CMOS to provide our climate water and resilience workshops and some of our 2.0 for free. If you need my email address, all you have to do is click on my name there. I would like to show you that if you go to our resources page, you will find our curriculum connections. On the English side, you will find curricular connections to most science curriculums for our Project Wet 2.0, our Getting Little Feet Wet, and our Climate Water and Resilience. Um, some of them are in one document. So, um, you can see we're still working on updating and improving and always renewing. If it's an old outdated curriculum, quite often we will um, have to remove the cross-reference and we hire certified teachers who are certified in our program to do our curricular cross-references there. If you scroll towards the bottom of the page, you'll find Canadian backgrounders and student sheets um, for Project Web 2.0, other Canadian supplementary resources. And then we um, have some a, docu a couple documents that um, summarize how to use Project Web 2.0 to teach climate resilience, as well as um, physical distancing, especially during COVID and winter activities, promotional vi videos, and then some music by Dr. Don Waite. And I think many of you know Remy Rodden. He was at the outdoor conference and Remy also has some beautiful um, English and French and bilingual songs. I just have to move my little screen here. Next, I want to show you is the Project Wet Foundation website. The Project Wet Foundation website at the top, you will see the store. That's where you can um, find some resources to purchase. I want to show you their education resource section here. Um, if I click on climate, um, until you're able to take a climate water resilience certification workshop, there is this free um, download for a lesson plan using Project Wet to teach climate resilience. It has, um, instead of soil to supper, it has dirt to dinner, an excellent, it's uh, similar to the activity in climate water resilience. Um, and it also has the um, breathing boreal. So those two activities, which you won't find in any of our other manuals, you can find for free in this particular document. I'm going to scroll up and go back to the education resources and I'm going to click on, click on e-learning. E-learning, the discoverwater.org is an excellent resource for um, early years, elementary and middle year students. It's interactive. Um, it, um, as it says here, it, it's, it's just an excellent resource. I've used it in most of my classes. And I don't know if I'm over my time or not. I'm going to stop sharing here. I know that was a really quick, quick little overview. I'm always available to answer questions um, through emails and, and different ways. Um, and just that we offer its professional certification programs. Okay, I'm going to stop there, Jade. <laughs> That was fantastic, Maxine. Thanks for packing in so much for such a short time. And yes, people, if you want to use the reactions buttons to show Maxine that you enjoyed it, please feel free. Um, yes, incredible resources, incredible programs, so engaging, so hands-on to learn about water. So thank you so much. Without much further ado, I shall pass it to the fantastic Laura Gilbert. Thank you so much, Jade, and thank you, Maxine, for that. Um, so I'm Laura from Water Rangers, and I'm coming to you today from the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe people on the island of Montreal. 
Um, and I'm excited today to talk to you about Water Rangers. So you'll see some links circulating already about our program, but everything I will talk about, I will send the link right after my presentation. Um, so you don't have to worry about that. I'll send them right away and I know they'll be sent to you in an email as well. Um, so Water Rangers were really a, a community-based water monitoring um, group. So what that means, community-based water monitoring, you may have heard of citizen science. So it's a little bit similar, but it's more of a bottom-up approach. So we help support groups like lake associations, education groups, classes, um, camps, really anyone that wants to get involved in water quality monitoring. Um, and we have two different tools to help them do that. Um, so one of them is these education kits that we have on the outdoor learning store. And I know there will be one up um, as a prize at the end of the presentation. So you have to wait around for that. Um, and we also have an open data platform where everyone can share the data. So these two tools can be used separately and the open data platform is completely free. We also have a lot of teacher resources and lessons on the website. Um, I will link to all of those after, but I just have a short presentation where I wanna share a few little things with you to give you a little bit more context. Um, so I mentioned community-based water monitoring, but we also call it participatory science. So it's essentially when non-scientists like your students or yourself get involved in collecting important water quality data. And why is it important that we collect it? Well, I have a question up there that I like to ask students when I do presentation. It's how many lakes, rivers, and streams are there in Canada? And the answer is 2 million, actually over 2 million. And in Quebec, where I am, we have over 1 million, and that's a lot of water bodies. And so we can't expect scientists or the government to really be able to be everywhere to test these water bodies. And that's why they need our help. And um, what's a little worrisome is that a report from the WWF, the World Wildlife Fund Canada from 2020, um, found that 100 out of 167 some watersheds, um, so this unit of land where water uh, drains into and out of, so the, the watershed, so 100 out of the 167 in Canada were data deficient, which means that we didn't even have enough data um, to know if the watershed is healthy or not, which is really worrisome. So there's a lot of data gaps that need to be filled in Canada, um, and that's why we can all help to do that together. So a little bit like the outdoor learning store and take me outside, we're really strong on working with partners at Water Rangers. And one of our partners is the Canadian Ocean Literacy Coalition, um, and they organize Ocean Week Canada. And I wanted to just put this out there because no matter where you are in Canada, there is most likely an event that you can attend either in person or virtually for Ocean Week, which is going to be June 2nd to 11th this year. And I know that OceanWise has quite a few events and Daphne is probably going to mention one that I know she's doing for Ocean Week right after, but they have shoreline cleanups. Um, they have different demonstrations and person events, as well as online events. And Water Rangers as well will be hosting quite a few, including um, some park runs where you get to dress up as sea creatures and run in the parks locally, which is pretty fun. Um, so it's all sorts of things. We'll be helping out with water testing. I know that Colk, the Canadian Ocean Literacy Coalition, has this giant map of Canada with uh, some um, augmented reality on there that's going to be in different places and that they ship around as well. Um, so I will put a link to the Ocean Week Canada website so that if you're interested and you want to find some events locally that you can attend, you can consult this. Or if yourself you're doing something special for Ocean Week and you want to share it, you can put it on their website. Another partnership we're starting is with a, um, a BC group called Ocean Diagnostics, and they've invented this little machine that uses um, artificial intelligence to essentially help you detect and categorize ocean plastic. So I have a little image of what it looks like. Um, and I've just put a little screenshot of their really amazing resources they have. Um, and I will put a link to their kit as well. But they have so many interesting classroom resources that you can take and lesson plans 
for all ages, even if you're not close to the ocean. Um, they have a little guide as to how you can set up essentially a little sand, uh, sand square in your classroom, get students to bring little plastic pieces from home um, and essentially do a little dig for the plastics in there and then analyze them, um, as well as just some activities that don't require any equipment. So I will link to that as well. Um, and I've mentioned a little bit about water rangers and we are branching out slowly into more ocean water quality testing, but at the root of it, we really did uh, we really did fresh water, but since we're all connected through water, we think that it's really important to showcase that. And I have a little demonstration that I will show you um, that ties in a little bit when talking about water salinity. But I just want to reinforce that kids can get involved in water quality testing at any age. We have equipment that I've used uh, with the little ones, you know, um, really kindergarten age. And it's the same tools that I use for the adults. Um, it's just different tests that they can do. And we also have some qualitative uh, assessments that can be done really just using your senses. So your eyes, your ears, your nose even. Um, so some things that don't require any equipment and are completely free to do and you can share that data and it's still valuable um, if you share that information online. So I'm going to quickly talk about connectivity. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for this. Um, I have in front of me, which you can't see, but I have three and here's the third one, little cups with water. And this is a tool, it's called the connectivity meter, which is in our test kits. Um, and it's super easy to use. It's just a little, um, like it's got a little probe and it sends a tiny current there. Um, and conductivity is a measure of the different, essentially minerals and salts that are in the water. So I'm gonna do this relatively quickly. I just want to show you what values we get in three samples. So I have one that's distilled water, one that is my tap water here, and one that is what I like to call uh, water contaminated with road salts. Um, but it's really just a little bit of table salt. Um, but you'll see why I'm doing this. So I'm going to start with a distilled water. So if you know a little bit about chemistry, then my distilled water should have essentially almost nothing in it. So I should get a value very close to zero. And I get a value of one. Oh, it went up to five, but it's quite low. The unit is microsiemens per centimeter. And five might seem high, but let me show you what my tap water looks like just to give you a comparison. My tap water here shoots up to about 248, 250. Um, and we're going to just look at the scale a little bit, and then we'll talk about what the value means. And my last one, I'm going to put in here, look at the units, what happens. It went to 2000 and then it switched, switched from micro siemens to milli siemens. And then now it says 2.66, uh, which is actually 2600. I guess it's 90 right now. Um, so this just gives you an idea. We had about five in my distilled water, 250, I think it was in my tap water and about 2600 in the one with a little pinch of salt. And this is just to give you an idea of what road salts can do to, um, to the water. Um, and I used to do this with snow samples that I would collect outside my house in Montreal. And I had to stop doing it because values would get so high that they couldn't be read by my conductivity meter, which goes up to 4,000 uh, microsiemens per centimeter. But if we were in the ocean, we would get a salinity reading, which in, in, in the microsiemens per centimeter is close to, depending on where you are, between 40 and 55,000. So that gives you an idea of the difference in um, how many minerals there are in the water. I'm throwing this at you a little bit quickly, um, but this just gives you a general idea of what we can measure with these. And um, we have some folks that test in Toronto, um, right on the harbor, and they have found measures of connectivity in the spring that are close to that of the ocean. Um, and it's really from road salts that are getting into these freshwater ecosystems. So um, this was just a little overview of the tools we have. I will put some links in, um, in the chat. And if you have any questions, I'll put my email in there. And like I said, there will be an education kit up uh, to be raffled at the end. And I'll back to you, Jay. Thank you so much, Laura. I always love seeing this hands-on, um, how like 
simply it can be to take to make real science and I found it so empowering for the students that I do water testing with especially it's a really great way to get them diving into these really amazing real world skills as well and doing good stuff for the planet so thanks so much and last but certainly not least uh making us envious with your fabulous backdrop um we can't hear the waves though your microphone's not picking it up but hopefully we'll get some of that ocean fresh air from you hi Daphne Hello, thank you all so much for joining me today. I am, yes, in fact, joining you from outside today. I thought that was appropriate uh, for the topics at hand. And I am actually uh, in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada today. And I'm actually joining you from an area of what is known as Stanley Park today. Uh, but this beach in this area would have been known as uh, Waiwei in Hunkamina, which is the traditional language of the the Musqueam, Squamish, and Salish First Nations, and I am on their traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories today. So I'm very grateful that I'm able to be here and connect with this wonderful uh, land and water that people have used sustainably for thousands and thousands of years. But because we're at the ocean, I wanted to talk a little bit about what OceanWise does. And if you aren't familiar with OceanWise, we are a nonprofit organization who is all about uh, empowering individuals and communities to take action to protect and restore the world's oceans. Now, I especially lately have been getting lots of teachers, lots of folks saying, you know what, I live inland, I'm not near an ocean, how does this affect me? Like, I'm not connected, I don't need to know about the ocean. But what, no matter where we live, just like Laura was saying, we're all connected to the ocean, all those rivers, all those lakes, those streams, we're all connected and make an impact on the ocean. And even if we all take a deep breath in, take another one, more than 50% of the oxygen on this planet is created by the ocean from plankton and algae that we see there. So we're getting lots from the ocean. I could go into that forever, but that's time for another program. What I'd like to talk about is uh, that we at OceanWise, we have a bunch of different conservation initiatives and kind of areas that we like to focus on, maybe they relate to something that you might be interested in. So Jade, if you're able to pull up that second slide, that would be amazing. Jade's here as my, uh, my assistant, it's amazing. Thanks so much, Jade. Um, but you can see we tend to focus on three challenges we see the ocean facing, facing and that's ocean pollution, overfishing, and climate change. And we've got sort of different areas that we focus on like whale health, reducing plastics, uh, choosing sustainable seafood, and even fighting climate change with kelp. So we've got lots of different areas that we like to focus on. If we go to the next slide, you can see that uh, there's a lot that we like to do to engage others about the ocean. No matter where you are, we like to do a lot of virtual engagement in addition to resources. So I'm actually the online specialist with our online learning team. So I do a lot of program delivery, uh, and coordinating those to make sure that we can get folks around the world connected to the ocean right here where I might be in Vancouver, but also to remind everyone that no matter where we live, there is so much that we can connect to around where we are. So that could be, you know, a stream, a river, a park, it could be anything that's near us. And if we uh, go to the next slide, you'll actually see that we are doing a free virtual beach walk right here uh, on Waiwei. But uh, it's gonna be June 5th as part of World Environment Day and World Oceans Week. It's gonna be from 1 p.m. or at 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific time, 4 p.m. Eastern time. And this is welcome to anyone across the world. So those of you in the States, you are more than welcome to join. Uh, there's lots of room, uh, but it will max out at a certain point. So I would say if you're interested in joining us, uh, register now. You can actually register from that QR code down below, and I believe Jade will share a link as well. But what we're hoping to do is kind of connect everyone to nature that's around them through a little a snippet of the beach that we might see. So if you're interested in that, um, I'm going to have a stop sharing our screen so I can show you. It's a bit high tide right now, so we're not going to see many critters. Um, we're going to be doing a low tide at that point, but what we will do is hopefully I can be uh, spotlit. But 
what we are going to see is lots of evidence today of lots of different life. So we might see things like some kelp. We've got a little tiny baby bull kelp here. Uh, we might even see some other seaweeds or algaes. We've got some other kind of more bubbly stuff here. We might even see some uh, some signs of life. So we're seeing some shells here. Again, when we're on the beach, normally we'd see lots and lots of animals kind of along the shore and along uh, some of the rocky areas that we might see. But really, what I'm hoping people can take away from joining us on uh, June 5th is that no matter what, we can always connect to nature. And no matter where we are, we're all connected through water and the environment. So I'd like to say, there's lots to join there. If you're interested in learning more about the ocean, maybe certain topics or ocean conservation uh, elements, we always have our virtual aqua class programs that are available as well. But if you wanted to learn a little bit more about uh, one topic around this uh, World Oceans Day, we are kind of focusing a little bit on some plastic elements that might be connecting us to the ocean as well. And if you wanted to dive into that, in addition to uh, this live beach walk program, you can explore a bunch of our education kits on the ocean.org website, uh, but specifically the plastic kit, we can share that, uh, probably the next slide, Jade. Uh, it dives into uh, that topic of plastic pollution and how it connects to all of us, how we are a part of the solution as well. And you can explore that there. I will say, there are so many connections. And one other connection I'd like to do a shout out to is that with Water Rangers and their amazing test kits, I will also be bringing mine along so that we can do a little bit of water testing while we're on the beach on June 5th. So you might get a little taste of how you might be able to use some of those resources as well. Um, but I'd like to say thank you all so, so much. Uh, feel free to join us for that free event and connect a little bit more to nature near me and hopefully take that to connect to nature near you. Thanks so much for sharing, Jade. Thank you so much. Um, ooh, which ocean animal are you? Take the quiz here. I'm going to leave that up for just a second in case anyone wants to scan it with their uh, phone camera app. Um, I think um, I'd like to think dolphin, but I imagine more like seahorse because, you know, size and, and that sort of thing. The majesty of the dolphin is yet to elude me. Okay, well, I'm gonna. You, you know what? You can't forget about all the animals that don't have backbones too. Invertebrate <gasps> fan myself, so who knows? Maybe there's Thank some you. other creatures in that option. <laughs> How amazing! See, thank you so much for sharing, and it's so wonderful to be able to offer things virtually because we know a lot of us. I live six hours inland from the ocean. It's it's hard sometimes for um, people to feel connected to the ocean. But of course, all of our hydrological water system is interconnected and what impacts us flows downstream uh, and impacts other people and what comes into our rain. It's all a part of something. So it's really amazing to um, connect with people. Okay, I'm gonna share that QR code for just one more minute. Um, okay, everybody, we're about to go into Q&A, but please stick around, because right at the end, we have got a bumper load of prizes for you today. I've got five English and five French project wet education samplers, which come with a few fantastic activities for you to use with your class on water education. We've got a free online workshop program for one lucky class. These are normally, um, you know, you have to purchase them uh, with Daphne um, or someone at OceanWise. And Laura Gilbert is giving up a fantastic water education kit uh, with some of those tools that she shared before. So please, and we've got a gift card to the outdoor learning store and a gift card to the Take Me Outside store as well, just to top it up. So please, please stay around. OK, for now, um, I'm just going to pull up the questions that um, Steph has been working hard to collate in the background. Thank you so much for sharing. If you are keen to ask questions, uh, please pop them in the um, Q&A. Angie's a jellyfish. Hi, jellyfish. Um, stingray, jellyfish. How fantastic. Share, share, your, share your ocean animal. Oh, how wonderful. What a nice feeling. OK, so here we go. Um, just to let you know, of course, we do have more uh, workshops coming up before we get to this. Um, oh, no, let's Q&A first. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. <sighs> Deep breath in. <sighs> 
feel the waves. Okay, Christine asked, if we're in the US, this one's for you, Maxine, can we still participate in virtual workshops and trainings with Project WET? And do you know if it's easy to have them approved by US school boards for certification hours? Thank you, Jade. Um, I will have to talk to your uh, national coordinator, Julia, to find out for sure, Julia Beck, but I did put in the chat the link to um, how you can access um, in the United States a workshop within your area. And there you should be able to also um, either email Julia or one of the other um, coordinators for more information. I don't know that answer for sure, but um, I can also send her an email tomorrow to find out whether you know that it's is an busy. option for you. Mm -hmm. And I do feel like there is a Project Wet US site, right? So uh, it's you a know. Project Wet Foundation. It was the one that I Project Wet Foundation is the um, American website, and the Project Wet Foundation is our mother organization. Project Wet Canada has an international host agreement underneath them. Okay, yes. so it sounds like your mm -hmm. uh, your possibilities are looking good. Mm -hmm. Okay, Meredith's got a question for Laura. Meredith was asking a little bit more specifically, how does that high level of conductivity impact uh, life in freshwater ecosystems? Well, it's a very good question. Well, essentially the freshwater fish and ecosystems in general are used to a certain level of salinity. And so if you increase that, it can have all sorts of bad health effects. A little bit like us, if suddenly we started drinking only salt water, uh, there'd be some really bad impacts. So I know for fish, um, Daphne, you may know a little bit about this as well, um, because I'm not the expert on necessarily what happens, but I know like if I'm thinking of sharks, it um, it means that they essentially like start swelling, they retain water a lot more. Um, so kind of like us, if we uh, start eating a lot of salt, there's a lot more water retention that happens. And over time, that can be quite bad for the aquatic life. Um, I hope that answers your question. I think that uh, made a lot of sense. So thank you so much. Um, really, really powerful. Um, being able to link science that you can do and really connecting it to biodiversity and ecosystem health. So thank you so much. Okay, Carol, this question is for you, Daphne. Um, Carol's in your neck of the woods or your neck of the ocean, I suppose. Uh, Carol's going to be running grade two, three camps this summer themed around climate action. Go Carol. That's how we like to see our youth camps run. Fantastic. Um, Carol is in North Van at Shipyards. I'm imagining that might mean something more to somebody who lives close by. Uh, Carol's asking, is there something they can do with OceanWise on their ocean day? Virtual is fine, but outdoors would be even better. Do you have some options? I would say I'm not sure if there's one scheduled quite yet, but I imagine there will be some uh, shoreline cleanups, OceanWise shoreline cleanups you can participate in. Uh, even if it's not run by OceanWise, I'm sure there's lots of organizations and people that will be running uh, public shoreline cleanups. You could also do one uh, with the kitties as well, you know, making sure that there's uh, protective equipment, you know, uh, little picker uppers or something like that. But it's a great way to, especially with OceanWise shoreline cleanups, you actually track what you're picking up. So you might be able to have some um, some of those folks actually recording and kind of seeing what you're seeing a lot of in that area. And I think that data is really useful and trying to find ways that with, you know, concluding or having discussions afterwards, you can think about how maybe they or their families can start to reduce some of those plastics they saw on their cleanup in their own lives. So lots of connections to be made. Uh, but yeah, I would check the ocean.org um, actually has an events page now as well that you can search for, and that will have any of those pop up on there as well. Great question. Amazing. I'm going to stay with you, Daphne. Jody's asking, how long would the virtual beach walk be, that online workshop? Great question. Uh, it'll probably be around 45 minutes to an hour, depending on questions, but uh, I imagine closer to an hour. Amazing. Daphne, um, I don't have my phone to hand. Is there a link that we can share for the um, animal quiz that's not from a QR code? People are into it and I can't get to it with a Google search. I need you. I, I, uh, maybe I can work on that. We'll see. Uh, okay. But uh, yeah, I, because I'm not by a computer, it's a little harder. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, I don't know if Heidi's just managed to make that happen. If you have, I haven't clicked on it. Yes. See, this 
this is community everyone and I I sort of say these things flippantly but like the hundreds of people who are here um sharing in the chat supporting each other with resources ideas like this is what it's about this is the best place on earth to work this you are the best people to connect with I'm so grateful this is amazing okay um I'm going to open this up this question's from Hanif uh, I'll open it up to anyone who wants to answer it. Can we use oceans as carbon sinks? Well, there's a couple here. Could we grow veggies on the ocean floor for human consumption, uh, like an underwater greenhouse? Anyone want to jump in? Go, Daphne. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I will say yes. Uh, one of the biggest ocean sinks that I think is really amazing is whales. If you think of a whale, they are massive, massive animals. They hold lots of carbon in their bodies. Uh, and actually when they pass away, they sometimes will float into shore, but most of the time they'll actually sink to the bottom of the ocean. And that's actually a huge way to have a sink of carbon go down to the deep sea. Um, and that's actually a great way to fight climate change. So something as simple as supporting whales can be a great way to kind of take carbon out of the atmosphere. But also we at OceanWise are doing a lot of deforestation, which is around, uh, you know, kind of growing and reforesting kelp uh, plant, you know, planting it either in ecosystems or even just farming it to, again, have carbon that goes into that uh, really, really fast growing life. And then actually maybe even sequestering or taking some of that and burying it in the ocean to kind of keep that carbon out of there. Uh, and real Quick question does anyone know how fast kelp can grow jade i don't know if question you know for you that. team i don't know how fast it is anyone in the um rebecca saying three feet a day it is about that so around a meter or three feet a day in the summer so like right now that kelp is growing fast so that means it's a really easy way to you know grow lots of carbon really quickly and maybe sequester it and help also great um, ocean acidity buffer and many other things, including supporting biodiversity. So lots of great examples. It's amazing. I always think, forget about the underwater photosynthesizers. You know, they do phenomenal work under there too. And that's where plants really came do. from, right? Out of the ocean and sort of managed to cultivate on land. Very cool. Um, so many stingrays, jellyfishes, turtles. Welcome to the ocean party, everybody. I want to do mine, but I'm too busy doing this, but I'll do it afterwards. I definitely think seahorses are going to come up, even if that's not an option. Okay, uh, Christina's harvesting their kelp in Alaska right now. How cool. That's how you know about kelp. Excellent. Okay, I digress. Here we go. Dorothy's asking, do we know um, if there are any medicine plants that exist in the ocean? And Dorothy's saying that specifically assist with pollution. So you were saying kind of filtration through sea kelp there, Daphne, Laura or Maxine, do you have any more um, things to share about how um, sort of plants or other things in the ocean sort of filter out pollution? Or do we just let Daphne roll on? <laughs> she is right there. <laughs> Go for it, Daphne. Do you know of any other parts of the, like, how does the ocean sort of help pollution? So I would say that some, um, some of the, you know, algaes and photosynthesizing plants may take some of that up into their body. Um, I would say, uh, I don't know about, certain ones in particular that are really, um, maybe somebody in the chat actually knows, but I would say there are some plants you might see along uh, the intertidal area that can kind of be used for medicine. I know that there's some here that we see that um, they're kind of squishy, kind of gas-filled bulbs have a bit of a goo inside, like a kind of a mucusy bit, and uh, is actually a bit of a sunscreen. So I wouldn't suggest using that instead of sunscreen, but there's definitely many traditional uses of uh, life around the ocean. And I would say that even animals such as filter feeders like mussels and oysters and clams can even be a sign or an indicator species of some of that pollution. So we actually use some mussels and others to look at what level of pollution there are in certain areas because they're kind of collecting all that for us. 
Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. And Christine, I feel like we, we need to make sure you get a prize just for all your sharing. But about horseshoe crab blood was used for vaccines and it's used for lots of other um, pharmaceutical development, right? Because it has this oh, yeah. incredible capacity for um, for healing, which is really amazing. OK, um, we're running out of time and um, that's it for the questions here. But again, I believe Daphne and Laura and Maxine shared their email in the chat. Um, you should be able to save it and download it. Or if not, in your follow up email, we can include their emails if they're happy with that so that everybody um, can reach out and ask some of those deeper questions. Um, but just from from the bottom of my oceany heart to yours, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's so inspirational every time that I get to be a part of these because I learn things as well. Um, and really, you know, planet water is so, so much a part of it. I'm not going to ruin one of the quiz questions that um, the work you're doing is incredibly important from inland to the ocean uh, and the ocean is is for all of us. So it's really important. So Lim Lim, uh, Cook's Jam, thank you so much. Lovely chat things coming okay don't leave prizes are coming um we of course still have some fantastic workshops remaining in this series um Jacqueline Scott and Ambika Tanetti are joining us to talk about race and nature for educators just heard Jacqueline Scott speak live recently uh incredible work on uh understanding diversity in the outdoors really powerful um John Muir is joining us to teach nature journaling on curiosity wonder and attention that's May 30th Jacqueline's May 23rd June 6th, we've got Elder Albert Marshall and Louise Amani talking about walking together, reconnecting to nature through two-eyed seeing, Western and Indigenous perspectives coming together. And our final one in the series um, with a couple of fantastic uh, Kootenai educators uh, and publisher Quilton Robert Goldsmith from Strong Nations, the Indigenous Publishing House, House, animating outdoor learning using finger puppets. That's June 13th. Uh, and so... Prizes. Okay, everyone, before you type in the chat, you know, if you've been here before, you know how it works. Answers are going in the chat. It might take us a little bit of time because of the generosity um, of, of our uh, presenters today. We've got a few prizes. Um, but for the first two questions, I have an English question and a French question. And I've got five English um, project wet samplers. These are like sort of a bite sized uh, project wet activities book and um, five French as well. And they, yes, it's type in the chat. So I really need you to click your three dots and change your thing uh, to everyone. So everyone can see, because sometimes people might say, hey, I was first, but you only sent it to the, presenters so other people didn't see it so Steph is in charge Steph's word is law in this in this situation she's she's checking okay thank you thumbs up whoever sent that um if you are one of the prize winners you need to send your name and email in the chat and you can do that in a private message by clicking on Steph's name it'll go red and say direct message uh or emailing Steph and um saying whether you want it in um actually we'll get to that when we get there okay let's just whoa. I'm too excited. Here we go. So first up, first five correct answers gets it. Are you ready? Fingers. How much roughly, I'm looking for a whole number here, of the Earth's surface is covered with ocean? How much of the Earth's surface is covered with ocean? I'm looking for a very particular number. I don't want to say the answer yet. Uh, no, let's let's let them. I think I see. There's definitely one winner so far. Yeah, I only see one. Oh, uh, there's two. Oh, two. <laughs> okay, keep coming. Keep guessing. <laughs> I can't see if there's a lot I of people who are really, really close. Really close. But I think I see are four these for the English ones. These are the English ones, please. Okay. You can turn your background off if you want to show. I think we've got, I see five in there now, Steph. Okay, the nice. Answer, I'm just typing names as I, as I see, as the you right see them. Yeah, so the answer um, overall is 71%. So really, it's so much for all of us. Look at that shiny book. It's really fantastic. And these activities will have your class in raptures i can tell you that because i do them quite frequently um really amazing uh hands-on 
um, visualizing uh, data in a way that really, really connects. Um, okay, thank you so much. I think we've Should got I all announce? of those. Should I yes, announce please. the five winners then? Mm -hmm. um, so the first five that, and remember some might've come through hosts and panelists, uh, if you were following along, uh, Alison Barton, um, Kawalajit Kaur, Victoria Sobi, Becky Masters, and Lorena Correa E. Silva. Hooray! Congratulations. Um, yeah, connect with um, Steph with your email and then Maxine will do some posting of generosity. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, uh, en prochain, uh, je, je sais pas, uh, mon français est mal, mais cette question est pour les gens français. Est-ce que tu prêt? Alors, quel est le mot français pour whale? Quel est le mot français pour whale? Mm -hmm. Sorry, Laura. <laughs> J'apprends mon français en France, donc l'accent est différent et je n'ai pas beaucoup d'occasions pour pratiquer. I don't have a lot of options to practice in British Columbia. Um, so that was about as good as it got for me. <laughs> but oh, do you have one more? Sorry, I nearly, I'm really bad at the quizzes, everyone. I get too excited like I'm participating and I'm supposed to be hosting. So I do apologize. <laughs> I think we've got five, hey? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I will announce them here. Le, I, how do you say answer? Comment tu dis answer, Laura? La réponse. réponse. La réponse vraie ou le, le, le réponse vraie? La réponse. Yeah. La réponse correcte est la baleine. La baleine. Baleine. OK, parfait. Merci. <laughs> Je vais échanger uh, en anglais maintenant. Back to English. Thank you so much. Le Berlin, the whale. Carbon sink. I've just, all I can see is it actually physically sinking to the bottom of the ocean now. Um, living its full and beautiful life, hopefully. And then holding that carbon for us. Thank you, whales. Okay. <laughs> the five winners were uh, Leo Wahlberg, Beatrice Gregoire Touton, uh, Kirsten May, Cami Fivery, and Natalie, Natalie Butters. I might have said the, a few, I might have said all those names wrong, honestly, but I'm sorry, forgive me. <laughs> it's difficult. It's hard pronouncing things, especially when you're reading them in the moment and haven't had a practice. So, très bien. Um, excellent. Uh, well done. Bon travail. Good job, everyone. Uh, that's all my French. I'm going to keep going in English. Uh, those little French, uh, send your email to Steph and then we'll make sure they wing their way to you in the post. So thank you again, Maxine and Project Wet for all your support. Okay, now we're looking for, um, this is for a Water Rangers Education Kit. Oh, it's it's incredible. What a gift. Um, so many different ways to, to do citizen science with your class. So, answer. Type Jane, in. I will oh, just yes. say since there is a big bilingual crowd, that the kit is available in French or English, so whoever wins can just let me know what language they want it in. Super bon. C'est possible en français. Excellent. Donc, I can't, I'm not, I haven't practiced this one, so I can only do the question in English. I do apologize. Um, okay. How many oceans do we normally split Earth's oceans up into when we're looking at maps and stuff? Oh, boom, there was a winner right away. How many oceans do we normally divide ours into? Jillian Russell, you said five, and we're going to go with that, with the Pacific, the Atlantic, Indian, Arctic, and Southern. And the largest, oh, Jade, I stole your answer explanation. Please, I just started going. Please, I love it. Go forth, Steph. She's normally working so hard in the background, but I think we're having a bit of fun today. So. Uh, uh, the largest is the Pacific, which a few of us are sitting on the coast of today at a whopping 60 million square miles. Amazing. Hard to actually wrap your head around, honestly. Mm, completely. If you want to feel small. Okay. Congratulations, Gillian. What Rangers education kit? Remember, uh, email French or English. Let us know. Okay. Thank you, Laura Gilbert and Water Rangers. Your kits are phenomenal, um, have facilitated so much learning and sharing in my students. We're doing amazing stuff where we're 
uh, the kids are doing their own science and making brochures and then going to our farmer's market and sharing that information with our community. Um, so, yeah. And hey, team, if you're looking for support for, for getting these kinds of kits that might be a little bit more expensive, um, again, they're available in the Outdoor Learning Store, of course. Um, you can look at something like the Learning for a Sustainable Future Action Grant. Um, and if you put it as part of a project that's connected into climate action, which it is, um, then you can get involved there. And there's lots of different options that are provincial or Canadian or US wide. If you go to outdoorlearningstore.com slash funding, uh, you'll find a list that we're collating and adding to of really accessible grants to support you in getting these resources. OK. Oh, winner 12 of the evening. It's got to be some sort of record. Pretty excited about it. Um, to win a free OceanWise live program for your class delivered um, with the same incredible energy and fantastic knowledge um, that Daphne's brought today. Um, and I will say we do have an option for many of our topics to be uh, given in French, if that is the wish of the winner. Très bien, c'est parfait, merci. Okay, so... True or false, we've mapped more of the surface of Mars than the deep oceans. True or false? All righty. Will, will we accept the first letter as? No, we're going for full spelling. <laughs> Educators, <laughs> grammar matters, people. <laughs> yeah, we're strict here. We're strict, very strict. Well, I used to make people write haiku poems and then I got in trouble for telling people off for have, not having the right number of syllables. So we're, we're stepping back from that. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it'll come back. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> so uh, Alison Barton with true. It is true. We have mapped around 20% of the ocean. And yeah, that's unbelievable. We've got so much more. And it says we need more ocean explorers. And I feel like getting your students connected to the fantastic resources that OceanWise and these other amazing organizations have will inspire those, those next uh, explorers. So thank you so much again, Daphne. Incredibly generous of you. Okay, I've got one uh, $25 gift card to the Outdoor Learning Store, which you can either have in US or Canadian dollars. So feel free to um, share that information with the uh, when you share your email, if you are the winner. How deep is the ocean's deepest canyon, the Mariana Trench? Wait for answers. One mile or 1.6 kilometers, three miles or 4.8 kilometers, five miles or eight kilometers or seven miles or 11 kilometers deep. So how deep is the ocean's deepest canyon, the Mariana Trench? A, one mile deep, B, three miles deep, C, five miles deep, or D, seven miles deep? Meredith Lemon, seven miles <gasps> deep. Like a shot, like that. Fantastic. Um, congratulations. So please, a $25 gift card to the Outdoor Learning Store will be winging its way to you. Um, share your email and whether you want it in Canadian or US dollars. And last, absolute last but least, not least, I suppose. Sorry, definitely not least, <laughs> just last. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it's been a busy couple of weeks. Um, I'm looking for um, one Take Me Outside gift card. Um, and that's just in Canadian dollars. The T-shirts are beautiful, toques, um, really high quality gear and has great messages like ask your teacher to take you outside or not all classrooms have four walls and they come in a range of colours and sizes. Um, my question for you will be, This might involve a bit of searching on the internet. I encourage you maybe to open the outdoorlearningstore.com webpage as I begin my preamble. How many Earthy Chat podcast episode can you listen to free? Wherever you get your podcasts, but uh, you can find it uh, at the outdoorlearningstore.com. Go to professional development. Click on Earthy Chats podcast. Someone wrote all. I like that. Mm -hmm. Inventive. Not gonna fly. <gasps> I see it? Do you see it, Steph? Oh, I didn't. I got. I was laughing at the all. Oh. <laughs> Le Leah Wahlberg, seventeen, amazing. There are seventeen episodes. episodes. They feature some of these fine, fantastic people here. Also, there's a heap of beautiful, uh, diverse Indigenous perspectives, um, musical perspectives, connecting the outdoors to art. Um, 
we hope there's something in there for you. Um, they're the fantastic creators of a lot of the resources we have on the charitable nonprofit store. And I encourage you to listen um, because it's a, it's a free resource and it's there for you. Everyone, we've come to the end. Daphne's going to go for a swim, like not on camera. I can just imagine you just like, just like mic dropping, just turning and diving into the ocean. That would be really dramatic, but no pressure. Um, okay. Again, thank you so much to our fantastic guests. Incredible uh, knowledge shared with us. You'll get a follow-up email um, first thing tomorrow morning. Please check your spam. Sadly, when we're sending this to thousands of people that have registered, um, and thank you for coming live if you're one of the few hundred who came live. Um, there'll be a link to the recording, um, a certificate of attendance, and uh, links to resources mentioned and contacts for these fine people. Um, it might be in your spam because we have to send it using one of those sendy email thingamabobbies, right? That just, you know, sometimes goes into the spam spot. Um, I just want to just be so grateful for you all joining us. I hope to see you at the next workshop or at the next in-person event. And um, I wish you a wonderful evening. Thank you. Merci bien. À la prochaine. Lim lim. Good evening. Goodbye.